Hello, and welcome to Humanities Matter, brought to you by Brill. I'm Lee Chung Greco, and this week we'll be looking at key issues in the field of humanities. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Mirella Klump. She's an assistant professor of practical theology, the Protestant Theological University in the Netherlands. Her book is Playing On, Restaging the Passion After the Death of God. Dr. Klomp, thank you so much for talking with us today. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So first of all, how did you decide to focus your research on contemporary musical performances of the passion? Well, it all started with uh, the the observation that um, narratives from the Christian tradition, as well as large musical forms that uh, arise from this tradition, um, have started to transfer um, or have started to being transferred uh, from uh, the church as and, and the liturgy as as a context um, to the the wider domain of the of the culture. So um, uh, this has been uh, going on for I think well 150 years at least, but it tends to be uh, it tends to occur more often. And we were wondering, together with the team that I worked in at the time, we were wondering what actually happens there, because we saw that um, the Dutch, yeah, Dutch culture is often said to be one of the most secularized uh, cultures in Western Europe. Then, why, for what reason, uh, do people appreciate uh, these Christian um, narratives and Christian uh, music? Why do they keep uh, going to concerts in concert halls? Uh, to listen to, for instance, uh, Bach's um, um, Matthias Passion uh, or, or other types of sacred music? Why do they keep referring to symbols and um, also in the language to Christian notions? Uh, and how does that relate? So I, tr- I decided to focus on um, the transfer of music to the wider domain of the culture and the transformations that go together with these uh, transfers. And then I chose to um, to focus on uh, on passions um, uh, as uh, one of the large musical forms uh, arising from the Christian tradition that have roots that go back to um, well the first ages of Christianity. And I'm wondering if we can talk about those roots a little bit more. Um, I found your book really fascinating as someone who grew up Catholic has seen a lot of different uh, productions of the Passion. Uh, Even the ones in the church can be very theatrical, um, very dramatic. For those who aren't familiar with the Passion, can you explain its place in Christianity? And then what does this particular Dutch production of it look like? How does the Passion in Gouda differ from a Passion in Jerusalem, for example? Well, I think the passion, um, well, we could say, I think that the passion is one of the most, well, it's at the heart of Christianity. The passion um, narrative is about the suffering and death of Jesus Christ, uh, followed by the the narratives of the resurrection of Christ. Um, That's officially not part of the the passion uh, narrative, although it follows, of course, after the death. The story of the resurrection. The story continues. That's uh, that's the base. That's the heart of Christianity. That death is not the end of of it, but there is a new morning, um, and that that there's life after death. Um, that has been uh, explained and and um, appropriated in many different ways in Christianity. But that's uh, that's another issue, I think. But the heart of um, of the Christian tradition um, is Christ, who suffered. Uh, who was crucified, uh, yeah, who was dead and was buried. Um, And that has been repeated and uh, that that story has been uh, told and handed down um, and has been part of the Christian tradition uh, for ages. So I think that that's, and with every time that this uh, story is uh, being told or being staged or being performed, 
it becomes more and more part of part of us i would also say so the ones who listen to it um are able to often able to connect uh, their own lives to um to this story not that everybody uh, is crucified uh, fortunately that's not the case but um it means that the suffering of jesus relates to the suffering of of human beings so everyone who suffers today in every suffering body christ can be found uh, Jesus Christ, the, the key figure in, in Christianity. Um, so I think that that's the reason why it's a very important important narrative that has been um, not only been told, but also been uh, set to music. Uh, and there's a whole, uh, well, a long tradition of um, new settings, musical settings of this narrative. And in the past decade in the Netherlands, there is a, um, well, a, a rather modern form of um, of passion that has become very popular in which i think the the, the makers of this uh, of this passion event because it's an event um, uh, or a spectacle try to link the things that are going on in people's lives in communities in in cities uh, and in, in in dutch society try to relate that to to the passion narrative. So there's obviously a lot of universal themes going on here. Uh, If I saw the passion in the Netherlands, what would it look like? Would there be something particularly Dutch about uh, the productions that you're looking at here? Um, Yes, well, the the most uh, striking uh, Dutch element is the fact that the narrative is is told by a narrator, but in between all these scenes, uh, there's music, uh, which is Dutch music, uh, secular Dutch music, that one could also uh, hear on the radio and listen to on the radio. So uh, it's just simply Dutch pop songs that are that have been used have been chosen to yeah to also to to help and to support uh, the narration of this um, passion and that means that for instance a love story uh, or a love song i should say uh, a love song uh, between um, uh, two lovers within the framework of the passion narrative gets an extra layer so all of a sudden when the jesus figure in in the passion sings this song then the love he sings about or the one he loves is uh, is his mother because he's uh, staged in front of his mother. And that means that when people after this passion event hear that music again on the radio, that they are reminded of this passion event and are reminded of the Christ uh, narrative, the passion narrative. So that's so fascinating how they take this secular part of Dutch culture, these Dutch pop songs that you might hear on the radio and make it so that it reminds people of uh, the passion of the Christ. Um, Can you talk a little bit more about this concept of the death of God that you write about in your book? Um, What's the death of God and why are you looking for God's presence in public spaces? So, when you have these people who are atheist or who maybe just don't go to church as much as they used to, and they, as you say, quote, experience the sacred, um, does that mean that they are experiencing it in a deeply religious way, like in an almost, you know, being converted back to Christianity way? Or do you think maybe it's much more simple that they are just enjoying this spectacle. Um, I mean, you have photos included in this book. It's a very large production. Uh, It looks very entertaining in the same way that, you know, movies about the passion or other stage shows about the passion, like Andrew Lloyd Webber's Jesus Christ Superstar are also entertaining for people who don't necessarily believe in Christianity. Mm-hmm. I certainly think that that's all that that's <laughs> all that is the case, but I wouldn't say it's opposed to uh, the religious aspect of it, uh, not necessarily at least. And the most simple comparison to make, I think, is the the historical event of the Passion of the Christ, which was which was a spectacle. And for some, it was entertainment to see this man with the cross on his shoulders. People yelled and people were interested to see what happened there. And so so this 
whole historic event was a spectacle. And I think that that spectacle aspect has never been gone from the passion. But that doesn't necessarily mean that in the event and in the spectacle um, and in the, the entertainment aspect of it, that's a place where, where God cannot be found or cannot occur or could, could not uh, approach people and where people cannot find God. I think that that's what I've tried to develop in my book, that, that God can be found everywhere and that there's no place... Uh, on earth where God doesn't want to be. So that means that um, uh, I don't see an opposition between um, yeah, between uh, entertainment, between marketing also, uh, because there's also a marketing aspect of this at this um, at this event and religious experiences. I mean, we should know one of the funniest anecdotes that you have, I think, in this book was that I believe you mentioned a lingerie store even <laughs> capitalized right. on the past. Uh, you say that, you know, there's no opposition to marketing, but um, that that does seem opposed to uh, the overall message, doesn't it? Well, I don't think it does. Why, why should it be opposed to the overall message? That's true, I suppose. I mean, it's, uh, well, it, Certainly seems a little bit different than uh, than some of the strict rules of Catholicism, but uh, <laughs> that might well, be a podcast for another day. <laughs> well, no, yeah, I think you're right about that, absolutely. But um, still, I think that why wouldn't God be willing to be present in in the bodies of people and also in the um, yeah how we are bodily, how we're shaped, and how we relate physically relate to each other. So um, it may be surprising and it may not be the first place, uh, a lingerie store may not be the first place where we would expect God. That's absolutely true. I agree with you about that. But still, I think that, um, that the, the unthinkable can, be, can become real. I think that that's what this passion narrative shows us, tells us, and, and, and what the resurrection tells us. Um, so from that perspective, it may not be such a weird place uh, for a cross to, to pop up in the, in, the, uh, in the window of a lingerie store. I think one of the most interesting points you make is how so many people uh, experience this in the Netherlands as a tradition um, that's almost on par with going to Mass. Um, you said yourself, I believe, that you were so excited to get back home and flip on the passion on TV that you sort of felt like you rushed through the actual um, uh, mass. Uh, so I'm wondering, what do you say to those who criticize the passion as superficial? I'd say, well, I, I'd say a number of things, but I think one of the things I have said in the past uh, uh, 10 years during this research, uh, there were many people who came to me, Christians, who came to me and asked why do the organizers of the Passion stage this event on Monday, Thursday, when we have our worship services? Can't they just go do it on another day? Because it's disturbing, because we cannot enter our city, we cannot reach our churches because the event um, has taken up the entire city or, or the, the marketplace or, or the big square of the entire city. And then I often asked them whether they thought they were the owners of this. And I did that in a, in a very, <laughs> I tried to do that in a very kind way, but I asked them, whom do you think the story belongs to? Who, who owns this story, this narrative? And um, oftentimes that was, uh, well, an interesting conversation that we had. But sometimes indeed uh, Christians appear to think that the story was theirs and that other people should just have it, well, at their own times, but um, that they came second, so to say, so to speak. I would say two things. The first is sometimes liturgy and the worship service can be very superficial as well. So is that a disqualification? That would be the first thing. And the second thing is that even in this superficial event, Sometimes things can occur which you don't expect. And um, we should judge 
the passion on the basis of what it wants to be. It wants to be an event for people who are not familiar with uh, the passion narrative, with Jesus Christ, because that's where it all started. Uh, the first edition of this event was uh, in 2011, when about 75% of the Dutch youth appeared to be unaware of uh, what Easter was about. And so that's where that's why they started the whole, uh, the whole thing. And um, just present this narrative as a, a narrative that is that's relevant but also uh, interesting or also just fun is something that um, that this uh, event wanted to do what the makers wanted to do so they didn't want to convert people uh, not necessarily wanted to convert people to uh, Christianity but uh, they wanted to uh, wanted people to to be aware that this narrative has has been an important narrative for for ages, and that could be a start. So I think it's not, and it's for the broader public. That was that was also the aim to bring the story back to the streets. And on the streets, you don't often find very thorough reflections on <laughs> on important uh, 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 events or issues. I think that with in a different form. The passion may not have become as successful as it as it has, and that means that uh, many people wouldn't have known about about Christ and about about the passion, about his suffering and death, uh, and about resurrection. Because every time the passion is staged, it it ends with the resurrection, and that's what people keep talking about. Thought-provoking research and arguments, uh, Dr. Klomp, really appreciate you uh, being with us today. Thank you very much. You are listening to the Humanities Matter podcast. You can find more podcast episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts.